ready to go. So good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, my name is Doug, and we have a we're doing a class today on garden pests. Pests. So we can make that as inclusive or narrow as we would like. I'd like to get your feedback on what you're looking for. Obviously, that's going to include um, bugs and uh, fungal problems, and we can always include the animals, because what would be a gardening class without talking about javelina here? Uh, and then we can also include garden pests as um, the neighbor who gives you unsolicited advice that's well, in, I'm just kidding. Well intentioned, but maybe not too accurate, right? So um, that's an issue. So I'll just kind of talk about some of these things, show you some products that we have to help. Um, we also have a um, clipboard handout. We have I have some really good handouts that might help you. Uh, and bundle. So it's cut lavender. It's just a wonderful smell. Uh, our cashiers are working on prepping them and so on. This came all the way from Provence uh, via a farm around here, of course, you know, but it's, uh, I believe this is a, a French lavender. So this is a wonderful thing to have. You can, you know, put it in a pot of water and keep it going. You can just let it dry out if you want, whatever, but it's lavender. It's, you know, the question always is, what do we do about it? What are they and how do you deal with it? So we have um, a kind of a process here where, whereby we take a, a, a cutting, a small cutting from maybe an affected area, something that you don't think looks very healthy, and we put it on the microscope, which in, is a, projects onto a computer screen. Uh, that's about a times 200 magnification, really helps. Uh, if you have aphids, and some people don't think they do, because they can't see them. And then when they're magnified by times 200 and they're crawling all over the place, it reminds me why I decided not to get into entomology because they're not very pretty at that en enlargement. And they're, they can be you know, bad news for uh, whatever they're on. Um, typical situation is roses. Any of you have roses in your yards? So, on the buds, you will often see aphids there, and they're kind of crawling around. Um, you can wash them off with a hose. Usually a more permanent solution is to use one of our sprays, and I'll show you a couple options. But since we have this out, I wanted to show you something else that happens. Not here, this seems to be okay. But see these little buds here, they're beautiful, right? But if you see a bud, that never really opens up into a flower um, and maybe has little brown dots on the side, that might very well be um, thrips. And it's always thrips, plural, because you never have one, you probably have thousands of them. Um, they've gotten into my pear trees, they can be all over the place. So what will happen is you'll just see this kind of stunted bud that this is on its way to open up, but if the thrips have moved in, it's never really gonna open up. So you might as well just cut it off, spray it, and then encourage, try and encourage some new growth in your roses. Spray it with what? I'm glad you asked, Ken. <laughs> I'm a straight dance. <laughs> See, since Michelle's gone, I need somebody to help prompt me, right? Now. So we have this product right here. It's called Triple Action. So it's largely neem oil. So neem oil, this is nice because it's fairly benign in terms of, you know, it's not going to kill the plants, harm your pests or anything, your pets. Um, and, and so if you have like some small shrubs, 
you can spray it with this. This is ready to use. And it also can help with um, uh, fungal problems. Like this time of year, it's raining a little bit, we get some humidity. Um, you can get uh, powdery mildew, let's say, on different shrubs, uh, roses included. Um, so this is ready to use spritzer that can help with the bugs, with the fungal problems. And we also have it in concentrate if you prefer it that way. But usually for a smaller plant, this works pretty well. And you want to spray it, not in the heat of the day, early morning, late evening, and try as much as you can to get underneath as well. Because these little, if you have aphids, they tend to congregate on the underside of the leaf. It's a safer place for them. Um, and so they can be all over. So I'd say the first time you really soak it, and then maybe, you know, 10 day, two week intervals, uh, depending on, you've got to be the judge. You've got to look in those buds and see if the aphids are still there or if they've, they've sort of gone away. Bear in mind that this time of year, these bugs, uh, you know, they. wide hole, dig a wide hole and blend in some of our mulch because frankly, uh, most of our soils here are pretty crummy. There's not much for the plants in there. So um, good soil to get them off to a good start, just like healthy people, you know, are more resistant to disease. The same thing applies to shrubs and trees and so on. And let me show you three fertilizers that we use this one right here is our all-purpose fertilizer. This is kind of like the, the meat and potatoes type fertilizer that you can use maybe three times a year. It's good for everything. It's light granular. You just, I just toss it on the ground, hose it down so it doesn't blow away. It just you wet it. You don't have to till it into the ground. And it's, it helps. Um, we also have Root and Grow. This is a... Um, kind of a composted tea, it's a liquid fertilizer. This would be good for any new plant that you put in the ground. Um, I think people tell us also they have great success with rejuvenating plants. I had a little shrub that ended up under a snow drift a couple years ago for, I don't know, three or four days. And it looked pretty sad after it melted. So I gave it this for a couple weeks and it really brought it back to life. This time of year, like with your roses or whatever you have growing, whether they're annuals in a pot, anything in your yard that flowers, this right here, this flower power will help boost that. It's largely nitrogen. It's really easy to use. There's a little scoop in here. You use one scoop per gallon, mix it up with water, and just go with your watering can and water the plant. Chances are, you know, you'll get uh, a lot more flowers. I have a lot of um, annuals on my on my deck and I noticed the petunia after two weeks ago was flowering like crazy now they're all gone so I'm going to give it another shot of flower power and this could be the watering for that day now speaking of that kind of thing sometimes sometimes plants like geraniums petunias um, they can get these little cut worms they're really small but they're sliding along they like to get in here and into the flower and penetrate in there and you won't get any more flowers. The neem oil will work for that. You can smother them, cut off the affected area, encourage some new growth. But that's it, another, another example of something that can happen. Now, if you have specific problems, we're always here to try and help. And here's something that came in this morning. I don't know if you can see this, put this under the microscope. This is from a small maple tree. And I looked at this and right away said, those leaves should be dark green. If you can see these leaves, they're light, it's kind of a light greenish yellow with dark green veins in there. That is a classic sign of chlorosis, or in other words, it's kind of underfed. So usually some fertilizer, 
Um, our, this, this 744 that I talked about, the all-purpose will help. The here, I think this gentleman has got some fungal problems on his tree, and, and he told me about watering it every day for an hour and a half. I said, that might be too much, and this could be the fungus that's kind of a result of that. So I suggested that he, you know, modify, reduce the water intake. And this is important. Anytime you come in and you have a sample along with the photograph, those are really helpful. We put the two together, we go to the microscope, and we try and diagnose. This was easy to tell, the chlorosis. This, not so much. I think it was fungal when he told me about how much he watered, which is the first question we ask everybody. So if you bring a plant in, it's really important to know how much water. And it, the answer is, well, it's on the drip system. What does that mean? One gallon, 10 gallons? I mean, I need to get a general idea of how much water. And to say, well, it's on a drip system doesn't help too much. Because usually, if there's a problem with a plant wilting and looking unhealthy, yeah, it might be bugs or it might be fungus. But so often, it's water related. And more often than not, it's too much water rather than not enough. Now, one of the the water just doesn't drain. So no plants are really going to grow there. And yet 10 feet away, she has deodor, cedars, and red buds that are just doing great, all in the same small backyard. So it's really important to kind of uh, find out about your soil. If you're going to buy a big tree and invest in it, it, we always suggest that you dig a hole before you ever plant it to do a test. It's called the perk test, where you dig that hole, make it pretty wide because it needs to be three times as wide as the root ball, and fill it up with water. If that water is still in that hole the next day, don't plant there because there's probably no amount of um, gypsum or amendment that you can put in there that will uh, al allow proper drainage. So clay soil and drainage are a big issue. And sometimes people think, well, that's got to be bugs, it's got to be this. It could be the water. And you might be putting the exact amount of water on there, correct amount, uh, but if it doesn't drain, the plant's never going to be happy, ever. So that's something to bear in mind. <clears throat> Now, now that the clipboard is passed around, I just want to show you a couple of things. Um, if you're, because there are lots of resources beyond this class that you can use all the time. We have these garden talk handouts, um, and here's a list for um, deer and rabbit. These are uh, this is a list of plants they're less likely to eat. No guarantees, but experience has told us they're less likely to eat this. There's another one for a javelina. And this is, since Havelina walked through my yard almost every night, I have selected plants from this list, plants they don't like. And so there are no guarantees, of course, but this is it's less likely that they're going to eat anything uh, because it's not on their list of, of um, plants they really like. These, this garden talk, this whole thing is available on our website under garden talk. If you're thinking about, you know, starting a vegetable garden, fruit trees, dividing your irises, um, that's all available. And today, in the email that Ken's going to send to you, will be a link to these two documents, because I consider these garden pests as much as any bugs or whatever might happen. And then the, one of the other handouts, um, which is really useful, is uh, pictures and a little description about different kinds of pests in the garden. The top one here is um, a tomato hornworm. Has anybody ever seen these little monsters? I mean, they're not little, they're huge. Yeah, and so you know how you can tell that you have one? You walk out one day and this long branch of the tomato has no leaves on it, none, because this little worm has gotten really big eating them. And um, they can just wipe out um, your tomato plant easily. Uh, and they're difficult to see. I usually wait till late afternoon when the sun is right on the plants and I can look in there. Some I have some friends who say, well, save them and bring them to my chickens. Yeah, like I'm going to save them, right? I mean, I what I'd like to do is 
is I just take my clippers and cut them in half. I know that seems kind of gross, but they're eating your tomatoes. You know, I get I get kind of upset about that. And so cut them in half and then all this green juice, you know, you know, comes gushing out and so on. It's not very pretty, but sometimes these things in nature are not very pretty. This handout, which I won't go through all the pictures, but it has real good specific photos of pests and things you can do about them. As far as the worms and tomato worms, we have another product here. This is called BT, which is an abbreviation for a long scientific name. This you can also spritz on your plants, your tomatoes, um, your, your petunias, uh, geraniums, that anything that has a worm on it, this can take care of it. Um, and so it's really back to the concept of making sure your plants are off to a good start. Then you have to make sure that they're healthy. Just like our cars, right? We change the oil, but can, we don't just wait till it breaks down. We do maintenance on it. You have to do the same thing with your plants. Get to know, are they getting enough water? Are they getting too much? What pests maybe have moved in over the last week or two or whatever? Uh, and, and this handout will help you to spot some of these. Um, it's not you know, absolutely critical that you know exactly what it is because these sprays that we have are pretty broad based and they will help take care of um, most any bug. If you were to, if you needed something larger, like you, let's say you've got a big shrub and you want the uh, triple action and you get the concentrate, those need to be, that needs to be applied uh, with a sprayer like this. And I have one of these for my weeds. And basically, you know, I put in whatever the label says, and it's important to read the label, and understand how to use um, this properly. Put a little bit of product in there, fill the rest up with water, and pump it up, and just go around the yard spraying the weeds. Um, so as far as weeds, we have a product here that's called Decimate. Isn't that a good name? It's gonna, it'll decimate your weeds. This is pretty good. You may need to do a couple applications, and it may take a few days, but these will, this will kill the weeds. I had some uh, Russian sage taken out and some new plants put in. And of course, Russian sage is kind of invasive, so it wasn't gonna give up that easily. Even though it had been yanked out of the ground, the roots had been dug up, it keeps popping up again, 10 feet away from where the plant was. I mean, it's hard to believe. So I just mix up some decimate and I hit it really hard. There's a little on off, it's easy to use. You can control the spray. And if you do something like that and you get one of these and you know they're all kinds of sprayers, you wanna make sure that you keep this separate from fertilizer or, or bug killer. Because if there's any residue of the plant killer, weed killer, that could get into your desirable, desirable plant. So you don't want that obviously. It's good to have two in hand. Larger spraying, for example, when I spray my roses, um, I use one of these Hudson sprayers, and that's all I ever put in there. Uh, yes, ma'am. If you use the decimate to kill like your Russian sage and you wanted to put something else in there, how long do you have to wait, or is it just that's done to that area? So the question is about waiting after you spray, how long do you have to wait? I usually don't wait at all. I mean, I'm not gonna plant that same day, and ideally, there's some distance, like maybe a foot or two between where you're spraying and where you're going to plant. So I couldn't, I replaced my Russian sage with some really nice grasses, but I had to give them a little space a little farther away. The hole's already there, but there were lots of suckers and roots down there, some of which I sprayed. So I tried to move it away. That's a good idea to move it away. Um, but for example, if I'm going to spray, I have some roses, for example, aphids. I use this Hudson sprayer. And the thing that's really good about this is, again, you can put the product in here and it never gets mixed with water. So if you don't use all of it, then you can return this to the container and it's undiluted. Once these products are diluted, they start to lose their effectiveness. Yes, sir, question? Okay. Um, and so you can, usually the dialing is to one, yeah, that means like one cup one ounce per water, uh, and you hook up the hose here and just start blasting away. This setting here will determine how much product, 
uh, and water you're going to get together. And when you're done, you should rinse it out with clean water. But this, you know, if you've got good water pressure, this can really blast things. And um, this is made out of metal, so it's not going to crack like plastic does here in our dry climate. And, you know, it's a little pricey, but it's well worth it. You probably won't ever need to get another one of these, these Hudson sprayers. Everybody hear that? Ken's comment. And the other thing that's, that's good about that is let's say you spray your roses and you're up above here and you're spraying down, but the aphids might be on the underside of the leaves and they're kind of hiding there. And so you can get under here and have the water coming up this way. So you can go down under because when you first start out, start out, if you've got a you know, major infestation of bugs, you're going to need to hit them all over the place. These are largely contact sprays. So uh, you want to hit them with as much of this as you can. And this little gadget helps. So this is really, it's a really handy Hudson sprayer. So one of the things about trying to, let's, let's talk briefly about animals. Animals that come through our garden, and I see these postings online about, oh, aren't these little baby javelinas adorable? Not, not if they eat everything in your yard, then they're hungry. They're not adorable at all. I don't like them. And I, I have a wrought iron fence around my vegetable garden. And as far as the rest of the yard, it's not fenced in. So, you know, I, I can't keep them out, even though my wife has blasted them with water and yelled at them and everything. It doesn't seem to bother them. They, uh, you know, once they settle in and they start eating, it doesn't matter what you do. But if you select plants, if you select the plants that are on that list of ones that they're less likely to eat, then you're less likely to have problems. And those typically include anything that's herbal. So lavender, rosemary, sage. Those are really a good bet. And they're nice shrubs that'll do well. And I have examples of them here. This is the autumn sage. Uh, I've had these for years. Hevelina have never touched them. The smell and the taste are too strong. I mean, you can just rub these with your fingertips and you'll get that sage uh, aroma. It's really strong. So this is a good example. This also comes in several different colors. We have them down there. But it's hard to go wrong with a, anything in the salvia sage family. <clears throat> And lavender, also another good choice. And maybe you can get in the business of doing your own bundles, basically. I mean, people grow these, you know, they, they grow really prolifically. Uh, and I think there's some farms around here where they, you know, people just have entire fields of them. It's wonderful. Uh, animals will stay away from this. And you get these nice showy flowers all summer. Um, you, and then another example is rosemary. So rosemary is a good standard. It's evergreen. Uh, it has little flowers in the spring and the fall. I have a huge rosemary plant. Uh, Havelina haven't reached in there to try and get to the water, but they've never bitten on this. Why would you? It's so strong, right? I mean, if we're cooking, we put a few little sprigs of rosemary in the recipe. Can't imagine, you know, a, a big mouthful. But the rosemary did eat my my neighbor had a bumper crop of apricots, a lot of which fell on the ground. So that drew them to our area. And the way I knew that they were there every night, because I could hear them crunching, because they crunched the pits, of course. So they're, they're kind of noisy eaters. Um, and other than tell them, look, go over there and eat the, eat the apricots, because I have nothing for you. I have rosemary. You like rosemary? No, they don't. Um, OK, so. Um, now, let's change the subject just a bit. I want to talk a little bit about this tree and shrub drench. Um, you know that we have lots of uh, ponderosa pines. Some of you may have those in your pinion pines. I'm sure you've heard that the evergreens are, have been hit pretty hard with uh, bark beetles. And uh, usually, the first recommendation you hear is water them make sure they're watered any plant just like we talked about a healthy start any plant that's well hydrated is going to be more resistant to disease bark beetles 
uh, it's more difficult for them to get into a tree that is uh, well hydrated and healthy. Uh, when the trees are drying out and they're unhealthy, they, they just sort of give up off that vibe and that's where the bark beetles come. This particular product, which if you've ever used this in the past, um, we had a version of it that's called, um, was called Plant Protector. This is called Tree and Shrub Drench. It's a once a year application. I put this on all my trees uh, once a year in the springtime because I just want to keep the bugs away because my trees are big enough now where if I have to spray the existing bugs, it's really a chore. They're too big and so on. So you mix this with water and you can just pour it like with a watering can around the trunk of the tree. It's, it's a really good product. And I don't know if you've, anybody here is pinion pines. You see, you know, sap oozing out. Ponderosa pines, they look sick. I mean, a lot of times it's because of the drought. They haven't, don't have enough water. But this can help with that. It's called tree and shrub drench. Does anybody have any questions so far? Would that help with blister beetles? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I, I didn't hear that question. Uh, the products that you recommend, are they like the, on the bug sheet? Are the products listed on the bug sheet? I, they're, they're not. They're not. But the bug sheet would be a good source of the So this, this is a um, indoor outdoor broad use insecticide. Um, this is one product that we have. We're expecting a shipment of another product that we more typically recommend that's called Cyanara. And that's what I use. It's Cyanara to the bugs. Um, this is something that you can use to spray. Most of the products that we talk about, like the neem oil, Cyanara, and this, they are largely made up of um, crushed chrysanthemums and a few other ingredients. And you can read the fine print if, if you want to find out about that. So this is not, you know, like super toxic things that you might find somewhere else. This is a good insecticide. Now you remember, remember the, the image here of this maple tree that, you know, maybe has a fungal problem. Maybe it's getting a little too much water perhaps. So we have a, uh, a biofungicide that helps with that. This time of year, your trees and shrubs may get powdery mildew. So I'm kind of changing the topic here to fungal problems away from insects. Um, it is not unusual to also get little brown spots. All kinds of things can happen. Um, but it's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean your trees are going to die. It's usually something that gets treatable. If we can look at it like any problem, you know, you diagnose it early and look at it here. We have a product called Revitalize. It's a biofungicide. I have um, 11 shrubs uh, that uh, some, one of them started with uh, powdery mildew. And from experience, I knew that if I just let it go, it would sooner or later spread to all of them. And then they would all have this. Um, and so I quickly, quickly got some more of this, mixed it again with water and did a soil drench because that's easier than spraying big shrubs. You can do it either way. But this, this concentrate and is really effective for this kind of thing. You may have to apply it two or three times, but not that unusual to get the brown spot, powdery mildew, who knows what else, um, especially at this, this time of year. Anybody have problems with ants? Yes. Uh, it's maybe a little difficult to answer in words. What does powdery mildew look like on a plant? What does powdery mildew look like on the plant? It looks like a little white powder. Um, and it doesn't have to be real thick. It can just be this sort of a 
hint of white on there. So it looks like mildew, uh, basically. So you don't, you can't see the green of the leaf quite as well. And I think, is there a picture of it on that handout? Yes. So powdery mildew, revitalized will help with that, along with cutting off the affected areas. So I went to my one shrub that was getting the powdery mildew and I cut cut off as much as I could reach that was mildewed, threw it in a bag, put it in the trash, get rid of it. And then I think three times now I have uh, soil drenched all the shrubs, even though some didn't seem like they were they had it. I knew that if I ignored it, they would sooner or later all get it. They seem to be doing okay. Usually with these problems, the goal is that, you know, you deal with the problem. It's not going to make affected leaves, you know, look better or, you know, they're going to drop off. But you want the new growth to be, look healthy. And that can be watering or rain would be wonderful, fertilizer, um, and, and the fungicide as well. Now, if you ever get red ants, my sympathies. I had some of these that were crawling into my house under the baseboard. Um, this is before, you know, I got good pest control. But, um, you know, I sprayed outside. This is another granular product for those big mounds, you know. And, you know, if they're out there and it's a big mound, that's not so bad. But these ones that were coming under the baseboard in my dining room, that was a bit much for me. And so instead of, like, stomping on them because they're all pretty big, I just vacuumed them. And, uh, you know, they kept coming out and I kept vacuuming them until after a while it stopped. But, okay, I think I've killed all of them. Then I sprayed outside. So, you know, ants are okay out there somewhere. Coming into my house, that's where I draw the line. I know maybe some of you feel that way as well. But this is this product, which is called Come and Get It. Wonderful name. It's good for red ants. So we have, there are from time to time, other pests in the garden. Um, this is a bug and slug bait, this right here, which, uh, you know, I guess we can get some bugs and slugs. We know we can get bugs. I haven't seen too many snails here. If you ever lived in a rainier climate, especially in the wintertime, you can get a lot of snails. Um, I used to have snails that tried to, to eat my everything in my yard. And so what I would do is on a, like a rainy night, I'd go out. This is usually in the winter, rainy season. I would pick them up and throw them against a redwood fence. And then they would drop down into a ground cover and never to be seen again. But I'd thrown them so that they would crack their shell and die. So for me, it's like, you know, no mercy. They're going to eat my yard. This, this is war, basically. So because I had, you know, dogs and cats, I didn't really want to put the bait out. So you know, hand picking bugs, snails, whatever it might be, is can work. It's sort of tedious and it may not, you know, be a long term solution. Um, we also have this other, um, this is the insect control. A lot of times we'll get crickets, uh, like in the garage, right? I sometimes do, or grubs. Uh, underground grubs are um, beetle larvae and they're they can eat the roots on a shrub and basically kill it and I had this experience once with a shrub I really liked and you know it looked it was sick it's dying and so I, I you know I pulled it out it just sort of popped right out of the ground and I noticed that no roots and then I looked in the ground and it was full of grubs and if you've ever seen those, this is another reason not to get into entomology. They're these white, grubby, curled up things. I hate them. So I was so angry about losing their shrub that I just started stabbing them with my trowel, right? And then uh, some others I just picked up and threw out in the street. It's about 90 that day. So I thought either they're going to fry to death or they'll get run over. Now, I'm not saying you have to do this, but to me, this was a way to get back at them, right? To get some anger off my chest but you don't have to do that you can just spray sprinkle sprinkle this stuff and water it in or you can use my method it all depends on what what gardening means to you right i mean you know we can't 
we can't like chase away the deer and have lean in our yards. We can just learn how to live with them, how to plant around, you know, what their uh, favorite plants are and that kind of thing. Otherwise, they're here. But grubs, I don't know. I kind of draw a line with grubs. Um, so what... Yes. So this question was about how to use this, this powder. Um, you can put it like in your vegetable garden because the grubs will uh, also eat the vegetable roots. Um, but you can just sprinkle it in the ground, especially like if you're planting something and you, there's been a history of grubs. Um, you know, grubs can, can really kind of take over an area and, and do some damage. So um, what else? Any other questions? Yes, yes. I have the little small ants, not the big red ants. Uh -huh. And I have a raised bed garden for my vegetables. They are all over the tomatoes and the zucchini. Mm -hmm. And they sting me when I reach in there. To, they're, they're just awful. And I know they like aphids because the aphids leave a sweet. Right. Fruit. So what do I do? Okay, so the question was about ants in her vegetable garden, which they're all over the place. And they kind of have a relationship with aphids because aphids will leave this kind of sticky resi residue. Some people call it a honeydew. And the ants like that as well. So I think that you can, for that, you can spray with this triple action neem oil that will probably take care of the ants. Um, if they are, if you want to set traps for them, uh, you can get different products at the grocery stores. We have sort of a little gel thing that you can squirt here and there, uh, and maybe they'll go after that. But, you know, it is kind of a challenge when ants try and take over, just like the ones that tried to move into my dining room. I mean, there was nothing for dinner, you know, that, but they came in anyway. Um, so it's, uh, it's kind of an ongoing thing, but this can, it can take care of the aphids and the ants, and then you get those off your vegetables, because otherwise, that combination of them they may do some damage to your to your ants and in the handout that we talked about ken and i it's got photos of just all kinds of things white flies uh, ants aphids thrips um, so you can get an idea i mean it's always important to have some idea of what is ailing your garden what's out there you know um, that helps in the prevention and and uh, so that handout can help you with that Yes, so then could you eat the plants if you like eat the tomatoes and you spray them the triple action? Yeah. I just wait a couple of days and of course rinse them off. Okay. Wait about two days and rinse them that you normally would before eating anyway. But the, the question was can you eat the can you eat the edibles, the vegetables after spraying with the neem oil? And the answer is yes. There's you know not really much of anything that's toxic to humans in there. You had a question? Grasshoppers. Grasshoppers. Glad you asked that the one thing I forgot to mention. So grasshoppers, don't, are, we have a good, this good product is called high yield. Grasshoppers, you know, you can't always spray them because when you approach them, they, they run away. So the contact sprays may not be as effective, but this, this is a granular product that you can kind of sprinkle, like maybe around the perimeter of your vegetable garden, right? And grasshoppers eat this and they get sick and they die. Um, a lot of people are very partial to nolobate. Um, this is somewhat similar to that, um, but basically it's just sort of like a, like a you know, mealy, granular type of thing that um, grasshoppers eat and they don't like. You know, or uh, I have a cat who likes to bite on the big green ones. You know, maybe have them come for a visit to your house and he'll stick his head in the big geranium and come out with a giant green grasshopper. He's kind of crunching on it, but mostly he wants to prance around and I say, look, just kill it. Thanks for, you're finally doing something to earn your keep. But, um, you know, absent an animal uh, that can help you with that, it, it is tough to keep up with it because the little ones are, they can be all over the place uh, and they can, they can really do some damage to a yard. So. Turf Ranger. Okay, so um, any other questions?
comments? Ms. Pam. Um, So the question is about the um, the bugs that get on squash plants. Those might be um, squash beetles. This, if it's wormy, I would use this product with the BT. I can't pronounce the Latin name of it, but BT is the good acronym. Uh, uh, if you have those squash beetles, which can overtake a plant and they smell terrible. So you try and squish them in there, you know, it's kind of unpleasant. I'd say the triple action would be good for that. Just spray it right on them. They're easier to see. They're not one of those really uh, tiny insects. Um, so what else? Anything, any other problems in your yard that you want to talk about? Gophers. Yes, ma'am. Gophers. <clears throat> you know, we have whole classes on gophers. You should get to hear Ken Lane's take on gophers, right? It's either my yard or the gophers, easy choice, right? There are people that come in here and say, you know, I wanted to trap these gophers and then release them a mile down the road. They'll probably get back to your yard before you do, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's not catch and release, it's catch and return. Gophers can be a real challenge. And we have a number of products, but I noticed that we have, the main one that we have now is, we have this little, and I'm sorry to bring it up, I could show you, but we got this applicator. We have an applicator that, is it too noisy there? Okay, the motorcycles. The sound sort of bounces off the boulders there. Um, we have this applicator that you can feel around for the gophers to look for their, their tunnels. And usually if there's a tunnel there, it'll sink in, right? And you have loaded this device with these poison pellets. And so the reason I think this is effective is that you get it in the tunnel. It could be somewhere in the tunnel. If you just put it in the hole, they may just cover it up and decide not to use that hole anymore. And by it, I mean whatever you're using. Uh, I think this is the most effective that I've heard from most people. This has worked for them. Um, and basically, they, they die down there and they're buried. You don't have to deal with them, right? Um, I have a friend that uh, had a dog that loved to dig them out of the ground and give them one big bite on the neck and drop them at the back door. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, you know, there's, you know, like a lot of these things, they're just kind of unpleasant to look at, to deal with. Um, but we have some of these applicators in the pellets, and I think, I think they work pretty well. Yes, ma'am. Uh, no, we have some small traps there. She's asking about using the poison in conjunction with a trap. You could do that. One of the things about traps is um, I'm always nervous. I'm going to set, you know, get myself in the trap. Right? Oh, but the gopher hawk, it goes down into the tunnel. It has a, it has a, a stage where you climb the tunnel. Uh -huh. And then the poison hawk goes down Okay, so she's talking about, I'm not sure if we have that, but Ken is kind enough to bring up this, which I think is a little bit easier to use. Um, so uh, thank you so much. So you can, um, thank you. So you load up the pellets in the canister here, and this is zinc gopher bait. And then I think it's good to go around you, there's no point in just doing it everywhere. You want to do it where they are. And if it feels soft and it sinks, then you probably have hit a tunnel. And then you can just crank it and you're dropping off pellets. Don't think that we have anything like what you described. We do have some traps and traps will work also. Um, but if, they've, if we do them in conjunction with poison, you know, some people are concerned about, well, somebody might eat that. Uh, you know, like a coyote, or, and some people say, I don't care, I don't want like either of them, but you know, that for some people that's a concern. So if you apply poison, I think it's best if they die underground, and then you don't have to deal with them. They're just gonna be buried there. Um, a couple years ago, I had a wonderful crop 
of red potatoes. They grew most of the winter, springtime came along. They were ready to harvest, except the gophers got to them a day before I did and pretty much wiped out the crop. So that could be kind of discouraging when you've been nursing something along, looking forward, thinking about, you know, red potato recipes and so on, and they're gone. I mean, they left a few little suckers, but that was, you know, I'm willing to share a little bit with birds. You know, if the birds come and eat even one quarter or one third of your cherries in your cherry tree, I'll take the rest. In the good season, there's plenty. But when they eat everything, that's kind of discouraging. Um, but uh, these, these subterranean, subterranean um, pests are hard to deal with. Um, and people come in, they're very frustrated. They've tried this and that. Maybe they've tried this, maybe they haven't. A friend of mine uh, created his own uh, device. He took a big five gallon bucket and you know, punched a hole and put a fan in there, like an old computer fan. And then he went down to the where he saw the hole, where he thought they might be, the gophers. And then he turned on one of these um, highway flares, you know, like your car stalled, you put a flare. That's pretty strong and toxic. He puts that in there and put it on the hole. So not everybody wants to create this, but this is a real do-it-yourself type guy, you know. And I think that worked pretty well. Um, I think this will work well also. That's a good question, but if you want more information about gophers and all those subterranean pests, uh, as I say, there's going to be, there is usually uh, a whole class just on that. But I'm glad you brought it up, and this is a good device. Also, class classes are And so I don't think off the top of my head we have a gopher class in like the next few weeks. But if you go to the YouTube channel, you'll find all kinds of different classes on various topics. And I know there's several of them. Yeah, and if so if you want to watch this one again, because it was so much fun and you want to see me again, Ken will have it on YouTube in, in a week or two. So It's actually live streaming on YouTube right now. Is it? Yeah. So I sometimes look at old videos to re remind myself, what did we talk about last time? What were the high points? You know, what got the most laughs from the audience? That kind of thing. <laughs> I we looked at one for, we have a class called Gardening for Newcomers, and it had been a while ago because I noticed that. I was dressed up in a down jacket, you know, with this fleece underneath. So it had to be chilly even under here. Um, but that was a while ago. So, but any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Once have we had like our yard, we woke up in the morning and blister beetles were everywhere. Mm -hmm. They were on the furniture, they were on the trees, the bushes, they ate everything up really quick. And we called the pest control guy who helped us. How can we keep that from happening year after year? And then also we found just recently this bug that has this big red or orange body. And somebody said it was a caterpillar, but I don't know. But it's like you get these crazy bugs I've never seen before. Okay, so the question is about crazy bugs like blister beetles. And I'm not even sure what that other one might be. But they, um, blister beetles can arrive at your yard in a large group and and basically eat all the leaves before you even can get down there and get a spray. Um, so I think to answer your question of what to do about it, if it's happened before, it could happen again. Maybe you're on their traveling path or whatever, and it might be good to have product. We have, um, I don't think I brought it up here, but we have uh, other insecticides. I think you should just sort of have that in your toolbox because if they show up, um, and you may not have time to go find something, come home, set up the sprayer and spray them. I mean, that happened a couple of years ago. This lady said, I'm called up, you know, kind of in a panic saying they're all over the place. They've already wiped out two trees. What do I do? I said, well, we have this product here. I think it was called 38. I'm not sure what we have. We may have a, another version of it. And she said, I live in Dewey. By the time I get to you and come back, I don't think there'll be anything left. And I said, well, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, you can go out there with a broom and hit them, but they'll they'll just come crawl back up in the tree, you know. Um, so it's it's a little bit unusual, but it's not out of the uh, and a little out of the ordinary, as you might say, but not something that's on, you know not going to happen because you live in a place where they don't arrive. They can arrive anywhere. Now that's sort of like you know the worst class scenario, but if you've had it happen, then you know what it's like. It can be very damaging. 
Um, and I think we've got some products down there that will take care of it. It's a little bit of a stronger spray. So you might be ready, I'd say with the, the Hudson sprayer, when you have something that, that strong, I mean that pervasive of an infestation, this is what you need. You want all the water pressure you can get. You want this thing filled up. You want to be out there blasting them because it's either them or your or the plants in your yard. That's how bad it can be. One or two, not so bad. You know, you can step on them. But a whole infestation, it's a major, a major problem. Blister beetles. So any other so questions? We, keep, we have six broccoli plants that haven't gotten any broccoli because the aphids just got into everything before we even knew. I guess I thought a brand new garden. Where, where would they have come from? I don't, I don't know. Is there something we can do to prevent it next year? Because we've tried spraying it and they're coming right back. And so the question is how to keep aphids out of the broccoli or the vegetable garden. Um, I think it's just persistence. I mean, I think the uh, triple action is a good choice for that. And I think you have to look at the plants every single day uh, because it, they can be here. And often. Yeah, right. It's like Mayor Daly used to say about voting, vote early and vote often in Chicago. Um, same thing with the bugs. Get out there early and often and really stay on top. You can't you know, go away for a week or two and expect that everything is going to be just ready for you to harvest. There might not be anything left. That's how complicated and difficult the, the, the battle could be, so to speak, just like the blister beetles. Imagine coming home and all your trees and shrubs are like stripped, uh, sort of a shock. Um, but I think that, you you know, they're going to come back. Um, there, I don't think there's any place that is immune from bugs, even though I once had a customer who said, well, I don't have bugs in my neighborhood, but here's my sick plant. I felt like saying, where do you live? I think I'll move into that neighborhood. And then we put it on the microscope and it looked like the freeway at rush hour. And so she was a little bit shocked that there were so many bugs on her plant in her yard. But you know, that's just kind of the learning experience. The problem is they're so small that we can't really see them. Even with your bifocals or your reading glasses, you might not see them. Um, so, uh, yes, ma'am. So the question is, you know, is there a, like a preventative type of spray? And yes, you could do the triple action. And that's probably gonna help a little bit, but a lot of these products, you know, they're, they're contact sprays. So they depend on hitting um, the bugs when they're there. You know, if they're on the leaves and they eat the leaves, it might deter them a little bit. But for the most part, you have to kind of be there, wait for them to arrive and then react rather than, you know, like inoculating the whole yard that unfortunately doesn't really work that way. Um, so, yes. So I have a question. Uh -huh. Like this time of year, okay, you spray a particular plant, and then it rains. How long does that spray affect it? I think that as long as the spray has dried, it's probably effective for as long as you need it. If it really poured, uh, you might want to spray again, maybe within a week or so, depending on what sort of results you see, if you see any uh, insects returning. But usually most of these, like the bug sprays, the weed sprays, they dry so quickly in our dry climate that they're probably good for a while. And I don't think they're gonna, it's going to be washed away. Um, so, uh, but I think that repetition is important, monitoring what's going on out there, um, you could look at this handout and refer to it and say, what's out there? Okay, well, looks like triple action could take care of that, whatever the case might be. So, I, I and, had uh, cotton leaf moss uh, on my green apples. And uh, it was insidious. They just uh, drilled a little hole in each of the fruit, and then you know, the fruit's room. Yeah. Cut to, it looks like a fruit. This is a little maybe blemish there, and that's their hole. They go in, I guess. And uh, but if you cut the fruit open, you see they they've traversed that whole fruit. So I sprayed the, it with that neem oil, 
as it was suggested, and uh, several times uh, in the fall, and then uh, and then again in the spring. Okay, so the question is about coddling moths, which can get into your apple trees, and there's a time of the year what it's most effective to spray. In fact, we have this whole arrangement, which we no longer have here because it's kind of out of season. The arrangement is that, uh, and you'll see this like in orchards a lot, you've got a little tent. And when the butterflies go into that tent, the farmers know it's time to spray the apples. It's neem oil may or may not take care of those, but the, typically they, they lay these eggs, they bore into the apples you know, later on, but springtime is when they're going through these life cycles. This is, this is another reason that if you read the literature about dealing with insects is to understand their life cycles. You know, when, you know, is it, are the eggs laying right now or the, are the eggs hatching now? Because you could spray and maybe it's not the right time of year, but coddling moths, there's a whole sequence of watch the tent, spray when you see the moths in there because the moths are going to go lay their eggs. And then the, those caterpillars, <laughs> <laughs> that was a little startling. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's come back next spring because if you had them, then coddling moss, you're, it's likely that you could have them again. This and this year it got solved because that, that freeze killed all the blossoms. So it was very good food anyway. Right. So it's interesting that, you know, we had a couple cold snaps this spring and some shrubs here, the new growth uh, was kind of zapped by the cold. I cut back a lot of those. And within a week, they had grown back. And so some people, uh, their fruit blossoms were, you know, zapped. So, and yet my neighbor the, with the apricot trees that the javelina likes so much that I told you about, her, her trees are so full of apricots that the branches are leaning down. They're almost on the ground. So why does that happen? Why, you know, why, why did you get zapped? Why did she have a, you know, a good crop. It's all because, you know, we have these little microclimates everywhere. Your backyard, my backyard is different in terms of the soil, the sunlight it gets and, you know, whatever's going on. And so um, n not everybody lost their fruits, their fruit crop this year. Some, well, you know, had a good directly, they might take care of the calling moss. <laughs> but but the, they'll probably, calling moss will probably come back next year. Yeah. So. Come back in the springtime for all the, the paraphernalia and the proper spray to take care of those. So I think that's it for now. We have a one hour class. We're just about there. Um, thank you so much for coming. If you have any other questions, you know, I'll be happy to try and answer them after the class or show you around a little bit. Um, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks.